When I was a young, child nobody, I often liked to sneak around my house. I'd memorize the spots in the stairs where I could step on them without them creaking. I'd eavesdrop on adults as they talked about, I don't know, friends or whatever adults talked about in the 90s, and I'd always make a game out of remaining undetected as long as I could when entering a room. I was a strange, strange little boy. Perhaps it's because of this fascination with skulking around that I gravitated towards stealth-focused video games like Metal Gear Solid, Hitman, and Thief. Even in games where remaining undetected is just one of many options, I almost always make an attempt to do so. There's something so gratifying about finding ways around bad guys instead of taking them head-on. And that brings us to one of my personal favorite series, Splinter Cell. After some recent reveals and leaks implying that a new entry in this five-year dormant franchise is right around the corner, I felt compelled to go back and play every single mainline entry in the series again. Then I figured that since I'm taking the time to play all these games, I may as well talk about them, and that's what I'm here to do today. I'll be going over every game, giving my thoughts on each, detailing what I like and don't like about them, and just to give everyone an easy point of comparison, rating them on a 1 to 10 scale, taking into account how much I enjoyed playing each title at release, and how well they hold up now. We're gonna be here a while, so strap in, folks, as I cover the entire Splinter Cell series in one video. Naturally, we start at the beginning with the original Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell, released in 2002. This came out at a time when I didn't follow games coverage very closely. I was only 12 years old, so I mostly found out about new releases through word of mouth and whatever commercials I happen to catch on TV. And that's how I learned about Splinter Cell. I can't remember what the ad was specifically, but I remember seeing a few explosions, thermal vision, guy wearing these goggles, and I thought it looked cool. So I memorized the name of what I saw and added it to my Christmas list for that year, probably thinking it was some kind of action game. But Splinter Cell turned out to be nothing like what I expected, and was all the more captivating to me as a result. Instead of shooting droves of bad guys like Halo, Max Payne, or Dead to Rights, man, my parents were irresponsible. This game was all about stealth, sticking to the shadows where going in guns blazing wasn't a viable option, and it was awesome. You play as Sam Fisher, a veteran soldier brought to life thanks to the gravelly vocals of Michael Ironside. Hi, I'm gonna kill you. Sam is, well, a splinter cell, a lone operative supported by a small team including longtime friend Irving Lambert and tech analyst Anna Grimm's daughter, denied by the US government tasked with carrying out covert intelligence gathering operations around the world. The game's manual describes splinter cells as, quote, like a sliver of glass, small, sharp, and nearly invisible. And I don't think there's a better or more badass way to characterize this profession. The game follows Sam during his first assignment, tracking down two missing CIA agents that were looking into the corruption of the Georgian government. That's Georgia the country, by the way, not the state. I don't know if this says more about me as a kid or the American education system, but I had no clue the country of Georgia was a thing until I played Splinter Cell. This left me a bit confused by the plot during my initial playthrough until I realized that, though it did finally make sense to me why the bad guys were talking in weird accents and not a single person was seen eating peaches or listening to R.E.M. One of the first things that struck me when replaying Splinter Cell was just how good the lighting still looks, and how shooting out lights to create more pockets of shadow is satisfying all on its own, which is important given that the entirety of the gameplay revolves around staying in the dark. Grabbing enemies and turning the camera so I could watch both Sam and his captive disappear into the shadows never got old to me, even though it's something you have to do all the time. You see, this game is a real stickler when it comes to hiding every unconscious person or corpse you make. It doesn't matter if the guard you just took out is clearly alone, or you go through the trouble of dealing with everyone in the immediate area. If just one body is not hidden away in a dark corner, it means an instant alarm later as the game checks to see if any bodies are out in the open when you pass certain points. And since three alarms means mission failure, or in some cases just one, you always have to spend some time on cleanup duty if you decide to introduce an elbow or bullet to someone's face. Since this is the first game in the series, it does lack the freedom and options of later installments, and makes a few missteps. The game feels the need to cater to the action genre crowd from time to time, with a handful of forced combat sequences that feel out of place, and can be a bit of a pain since the controls simply weren't designed for full-scale shootouts. Missions are linear in nature, with typically one correct pathway, and the number of options you have at your disposal is pretty limited, especially at first when you're without the SC-20K rifle giving you more non-lethal tools in addition to sniping capabilities. The design of Splinter Cell relies heavily on trial and error, walking into a situation full of unknowns with a good chance of screwing up in some way, and then trying again with the knowledge you now have. When I first played it on the original Xbox, this could lead to some frustration, especially when combined with the fact that the game used a checkpoint-based save system. Now, I'm of the opinion that checkpoints in stealth games are always a bad idea, at least if there's not a manual save option available. Why? 
Well, imagine you've snuck through an entire area, doing everything right, only for the last guard to turn around a second before you expected him to. Or the headshot you've meticulously lined up randomly misses because your bullet decided to curve to the left as if it was being fired at Angelina Jolie. Which does happen in this game, by the way, I guess to add a sense of realism or to increase the tension of choosing to fire your gun, I don't know. Guards shoot you, alarms go off, you probably die, and now you have to do the entire area again. That second time through isn't engaging, it isn't satisfying, it's now a tedious chore, and the pacing of the whole mission is worsened. Now, some would argue that the second run is punishment for screwing up, and you need those checkpoints to maintain tension. But this is a false argument to me, as other games and entries in this very series allowed quick saving without tension being affected at all. And if you're a purist that thinks quick saves are cheap and shouldn't be used, then you have the option to just ignore them. Thankfully, I didn't run into this problem when playing it now, because I played the PC version for this video. And if you do intend to revisit this original classic as well, that's the version I recommend. Not only does it have this wonderful Save Anywhere option that practically eliminates any annoyance the game once had, but it can be easily tweaked to run at a modern resolution, the keyboard and mouse controls feel natural almost immediately, and it's cheap and easily accessible through Steam. On top of that, there are three additional downloadable missions that were originally exclusive to the Xbox version, including one that wraps up a loose thread left dangling from the main story, that can be easily reinserted into the game as long as you're willing to spend a few minutes on Google to find them, making the PC version the most complete package. It certainly feels like the first in what would become a long-running series, and I fully admit that I'm wearing my rose-tinted nostalgia glasses, but I still love the original Splinter Cell and believe it holds up pretty darn well. I had plenty of fun playing through it again, and if you're a fan of stealth games, it's absolutely worth experiencing even 16 years after its debut. 8 out of 10. With quick saves. <clears throat> Hi, um, I'm Craig, Critical Nobody, the voice you've been listening to this whole time. Uh, I'm here to do a bit of a PSA on Pandora tomorrow. So when going back and playing these games again, I wanted to do so in the most convenient way possible, and in the case of Pandora Tomorrow, I figured that was the HD version that's available on PS3. It upscales the game to a higher resolution, but it also incorporates quick saves, which were not originally there. Well, that sounds like the best version to me, so I plopped down $15, played through the whole thing, and uh, don't buy this version. This port seems to be very poorly optimized, as I experienced this consistent hitching that wasn't there in the original release. Hitches when just moving through the environment, hitches when firing my gun, and most notably, hitches in between lines of dialogue as if the game is struggling to load the next sentence. And four words in the body text, Redbeard, Saulnier, and Springfield. This happened throughout my playthrough, and while it kinda seemed to smooth itself out as the game went on, it never entirely went away. It bothered me so much that I actually went on Amazon and just bought a copy of the original for like six bucks. So if you do decide to revisit Pandora tomorrow from watching this video, I'd recommend doing the same. Yeah, I know I'm like eight years late to this, but if I can stop just one person from making the same mistake I did, then it's totally worth it. Friends don't let friends buy bad games. Now that that's out of the way, back to the video. Why, why did I do that? In 2004, two years after the first game, came Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell Pandora Tomorrow. Having been such a big fan of the first, I watched this game's release date like a hawk, absorbing every piece of media I could about it, excited to play the next chapter in Sam Fisher's story. And when I finally got my hands on the game, I found myself a bit disappointed in regards to one part of it, and blown away by the other. Let's start with the story. Skynet has successfully taken over the world with robots wearing human flesh walking the Earth. Oh, sorry, that's just how people look in cutscenes. Seriously, they look weird, right? I remember them being off-putting to me as a kid, and yeah, everyone still looks really creepy, like they're made of rubber. <laughs> the plot actually follows Sam looking into a ruthless guerrilla leader named Sedono and preventing a smallpox virus from being unleashed in the US. For the most part, this game is more of what the original offered, with some tweaks and quality of life improvements. You can now whistle to attract guards toward you, doors can now be opened while carrying bodies, the light meter will blink to let you know it's a safe place to hide them, keypad codes appear on screen so you don't have to pause the action to look up the correct one, and Sam has a few new moves like a SWAT turn to move between doorways, and a half-split jump that can be used to reach higher platforms. Missions also take place in much more diverse locations, though they do retain their linearity. As good as I thought the first game was, its environments did tend to blend together with lots of generic office building settings. 
In Pandora Tomorrow, there are missions in jungle encampments, the city of Jerusalem, LAX airport, and an infiltration of a speeding train moving across Paris, with Sam scaling under as well as on the side of the locomotive. It's really cool, and is still one of the most standout missions in the series, at least in my eyes. All of these sound like good things, and they are, but there's always been something about Pandora Tomorrow that felt a bit off to me, as if it was made by a different developer. And that's because it was. While the first Splinter Cell was made by Ubisoft Montreal, development duties for the second game went to Ubisoft Shanghai, presumably so the folks in the Great White North could focus all their efforts on the next installment. As a result, playing Pandora both as a teenager and now has never felt as good to me as playing the original. It's hard to describe to someone who hasn't played both titles themselves, but there are more times in this game where I feel myself calling bullshit. Guards seeing me despite me being hidden. There's somebody there. Guys I'm sneaking up on apparently hearing my movements and turning around despite moving quietly. What's that noise? Stuff like that. I'm not saying these things happen all the time, but they happen frequently enough to be a pretty sizable pain. Unlike the first game, where guards would typically have to run to a panel to sound an alarm, giving you the chance to stop them if you were fast enough, here, being spotted pretty much means instant alert, even if you take out whoever saw you before they'd logically be able to get the word out. Although this is balanced out somewhat by alarms being reduced if you manage to remain stealthy for a while after the fact. All of this on top of the return of a checkpoint-based system, and these inconsistencies are even more aggravating. The other notable thing that feels off is the voice acting. With the exception of Michael Ironside, who once again does a great job voicing Sam, sounding even more comfortable in the role than he already did. I'm going inside to meet your friends. Anything I need to worry about? They have guns. I'm shocked and amazed. All other returning characters are voiced by different actors. I love me some President Palmer slash Allstate man as much as the next guy, but hearing his voice coming out of Lambert hasn't ever really fit to me. It's not that the actors are doing a particularly bad job or anything, but both him and Grimm sound more generic in one note than the originals. And that's before we get into the NPC dialogue, which is honestly bad. Some of these lines sound like they had unpaid interns do one take and then just threw it in the game. Yes, I will keep on being busy. I'm a musician. My ears are very sensitive. Let me just finish my orange juice. How long do you think it'll take them to find the Frenchman? What do you mean, Frenchman? We're all Frenchmen here. I mean the French Frenchman. I've done my fair share of complaining, but I want to stress that I do like the campaign of Pandora Tomorrow, and it does make some smart additions to the core gameplay of Splinter Cell, but it has enough issues that make it inferior in comparison as far as the campaign goes. But all sins are forgiven when you include the multiplayer. This shit was as amazing as it was unique, and it was very unique, pitting spies up against mercs in intense 2v2 matches. Spies were tasked with sneaking into a level to steal or destroy virus vials while the mercs played defense trying to protect them. And in a neat touch, the multiplayer actually tied directly into the main story, which I've always appreciated as most games don't even bother coming up with these kinds of justifications. Spies were acrobatic and had more situational awareness given their third-person perspective, while mercs were in first person with lethal firepower and tools to detect intruders, making each side feel distinct and fun. I spent many a late night snapping necks and shooting sneaky boys, and just playing through the multiplayer tutorials again filled me with an overwhelming amount of nostalgia. But it also filled me with great sadness. Since servers were shut down years ago, there's no way to play online anymore, so if you weren't able to play it yourself back in the day, you just can't now. I've been saying this for years, but please, Ubisoft, just take this part of the game and re-release it. You don't even have to remaster the graphics or HDify it, just rip it out and throw it on digital stores. Charge like $15 for it and I'll play the shit out of it. I'll even deal with the tire fire that is Uplay just to play it again. Do it. Please. With the original multiplayer included, I'd say Pandora Tomorrow is as good a package as the original game, if not slightly better. But taking into account that that part of the game is no longer available, all that's left to judge is the campaign, which is good, but in my opinion not quite as good, with more flaws. So overall, Pandora Tomorrow is a solid 7 out of 10. The very next year, in 2005, the world was graced with Splinter Cell Chaos Theory, and this game, this fucking game, is a masterpiece. I don't see any point in burying the lead here, Chaos Theory is hands down the best game in the series, one of the best stealth titles ever made, one of the best games of all time period, and one of my personal favorites. Where do I even begin? I guess I'll start with the graphics, which were jaw-dropping at release and, you know what, still look great now. Aside from some low-detail character models. 
The fluid animation, excellent lighting, environments that feel like real locations, every inch of this game is impeccably crafted. Then there's playing it, and wow, what a leap up from the previous games. While the first two could feel restrictive, with usually only one real correct path through areas, Chaos Theory gives so much freedom to the player, with multiple ways to approach situations, and you're encouraged to get up close and personal with enemies more than ever before. Whether you're taking a non-lethal approach or shanking everyone you come across with Sam's new knife, you feel so empowered. In the original game where Pandora Tomorrow and Lambert forbade you from killing anyone, it could feel like you were being gimped a good amount. But in the two levels in Chaos Theory where you're not allowed to go lethal, it's not at all an issue because of how many tools you still have left at your disposal. The sheer number of additions and tweaks to the established formula are as numerous as they are great. Multiple side and bonus objectives that encourage you to explore every inch of a level, new acrobatic moves like taking out guys while hanging from a pipe, the knife, which not only makes Sam more lethal and looks incredibly intimidating when held to some poor guy's throat, but also opens more options like cutting through tarps or breaking locks if you're in a hurry, the addition of a sound meter that measures how much noise you're making as well as the ambient noise in the environment, an EMP jammer attached to Sam's pistol letting you temporarily disable lights and other electronics without the mess of shattering them, bodies have to be physically discovered by enemies for an alert to be issued, and multiple alarms no longer result in a mission failure instead just making things more difficult. Don't tell me. Three alarms and the mission is over? Of course not. This is no video game, Fisher. Hacking gives you the option to bypass keypads and other security systems and can honestly break the game at times. Built-in quick saves for the first time in the series, which as we've established before, are always awesome. And some of the finest levels ever crafted for a stealth game. There's a bank heist mission in this that is one of my favorite bank heist things in any game. I've played through it so many times that I know how to completely ghost through it, meaning I don't take out any guards whatsoever. It's one of those levels I know so well that when I see someone playing it incorrectly, I just... I... Okay, I'm gonna go off on a bit of a tangent here, so if you just want to skip this part and hear me talk about the game itself some more, go ahead to this timestamp. You're welcome. So some of you may remember the G4 network. It was a TV channel dedicated to pop culture, like movies, comic books, and video games. And there was a show on there called Cheat. It ran for multiple seasons and offered tips and tricks, as well as walkthroughs for levels across various games. And they had an entire episode dedicated to Chaos Theory at release. And in this episode, they do a guide on the bank mission, and oh my god, it's just so wrong. It's wrong. It's wrong! It's been 13 years since I saw this segment, and it's so full of bad information that I still lay awake at night thinking about it. I could spend, like, an hour going over all the stupid in this so-called walkthrough. Damn, we killed the hell out of that guy, huh? But to save time, I'm just gonna highlight a few key stupid points. The insertion point is crawling with patrolling guards. It's best to eliminate them before entering. Or you could just walk right past them, since there's tons of room. Next, interrogate this guard who forgot about the you snooze, you lose rule. Or you could just go through the other door on the left, which is also the optimal path for hitting all of your objectives in order. Hack into the computer and hit the access switch. The vault door is now open, so head back to the treasurer's office. Where are you going? There's literally a window right there where you can climb out that gets you to the office in no time. God! If you haven't yet, stop stalling and take out the guards in the security room. You're gonna have to deal with them eventually. No! No, you won't! You don't have to kill any of them for fuck's sake! As you extract, you'll face an unavoidable laser grid, which will trigger the alarms. Oh, unavoidable. You mean this thing right here that I just avoided? You are made of stupid. <sighs> Man, that feels good. I exposed the awfulness of a TV show segment that no one's thought about in over a decade. It was totally worth my dignity. With that incredibly important work done, let's gush about Chaos Theory some more. The way the game dynamically reacts to your actions is really cool. Let's say you have an optional objective in one mission to find out a piece of information, but you fail to complete it. Well, sometimes in the next mission, you'll be given an additional objective to make up for that task that you missed. Dialogue also changes depending on how you complete certain objectives and the order in which you do them. There's a part where you come across these old computers and have to activate them in a specific order. The first time you play it, you probably don't know what to do, and the dialogue reflects that ignorance. But if you replay the mission and skip the instructions, there's entirely different dialogue to reflect that Sam already knows what he's doing. And holy crap, I didn't even notice this until replaying the game for this video, but if you just keep screwing up, setting off alarm after alarm, your support team gets noticeably short with you. They stop joking around or giving you extended details, they become very matter-of-fact and kinda cold. How many other games even bother to do that? Now, is the campaign perfect? Yes. Okay, no, but no game is perfect, and the flaws I'm about to bring up really are nitpicky. Back in the day, I dedicated myself to mastering every level, trying to get a perfect stealth rating of 100% on each one. 
meaning you have to complete every objective, you can't trigger alarms, no bodies can be found, and you can't kill anyone. Although you can knock out as many people as you want. For most of the levels, doing this is pretty straightforward, but there are a few later ones where getting 100% can come down to luck. The bathhouse in particular is the biggest offender of this. The level plays out fine at first, but at a certain point, things go south and you're forced to sneak by two groups having a firefight while lights flicker. And it can be a roll of the dice in regards to whether or not they see you. And then you come across this room with three armed guards staring at the door, and the only way past them without being seen is to throw smoke grenades and run by with your fingers crossed hoping you don't get spotted. In addition, there are some bonus objectives that are really easy to miss unless you know about them ahead of time, like saving the two pilots at the end of the soul level. And finally, the last mission in the game feels a bit underwhelming. It's a fine mission, don't get me wrong, and it has a really cool optional moment where Sam can get captured and interrogated, but it comes after this big climactic moment where Sam has to take on an old friend, and it just feels a bit weirdly placed. And I feel like it might have been better served as the second to last level instead. So the campaign itself is excellent, and it's not even all that Chaos Theory offered. A short, but incredibly fun co-op campaign was introduced that runs parallel to the main story, and required real teamwork and communication. Coordinating takedowns against guards, doing co-op moves to access new areas, it was a great addition. There was even this neat touch where if you were talking to your buddy on a headset, the volume you were speaking at was taken into account in-game, meaning guards could hear you talking if you weren't careful. So awesome! And of course, the kick-ass multiplayer from Pandora Tomorrow returned with a few new additions. The player count was raised from 4 to 6, allowing for 3v3 matches, as well as some new gadgets and co-op moves for the spies. It was basically an improved version of Pandora's competitive offering, so it was just as great. Official servers for Chaos Theory were also shut down years ago, but it's come to my attention that it is still technically possible to play Chaos Theory online, as long as you're on PC and willing to jump through a few hoops. I'm too dumb and lazy to figure it out myself, but there are guides out there to teach you how to do it, and I've seen videos of everything working, so the option is there if any of you are interested. And how could I forget that on top of all of that content, Chaos Theory also came with a teaser trailer for the Splinter Cell movie! You've entered his world. You've played the games. But you won't know the whole story until you've seen the movie. Well, I guess we'll never know the full story then. I think I've spent long enough gushing over Chaos Theory. It's just so damn excellent, and I can't tell you enough times to play it yourself. Even if it didn't have the cool additions of the co-op and the multiplayer, the single-player experience alone is worth full price. This really shouldn't surprise anyone, but Splinter Cell Chaos Theory is a 10 out of 10. So how do you follow up the genre-defining masterwork that is Chaos Theory? Kill Sam's daughter! In 2006, we got Splinter Cell Double Agent, which has the distinction of being one of the earliest releases for the seventh generation of consoles. From my perspective, Double Agent seems to be blanked out of most people's memory. I've had plenty of conversations with fellow fans of the franchise, and whenever the fourth entry in this series comes up, the response I get is typically, Oh, yeah, I forgot about that one. Maybe the reason for the lapse in memory is the lesser quality of the game when compared to its predecessor, though in my opinion it's still a good, if flawed, entry. After an ultimately pointless mission in Iceland, Sam is abruptly told his daughter Sarah, who's been mentioned and seen here and there in previous games, was tragically killed by a drunk driver, and this sends Sam spiraling into a destructive depression. To get him out of this slump, Lambert does what any good friend would do. Send Sam to prison to go undercover infiltrating a dangerous terrorist organization. I think I might have suggested therapy first, but okay. And from there, Sam joins the ranks of John Brown's army, or JBA for short, to stop whatever the group is planning. The 360 generation had an on-and-off trend of trying to take games in a more dark and gritty direction, and Double Agent sets up that tone, but never really follows through on it. After a short montage, Sam pretty much goes back to normal, just with a smooth scalp. He never seems to struggle with his grief or show much in the way of emotion about his current situation. He basically goes about business as usual, and it does feel like a missed opportunity. When you really break it down, Double Agent is essentially just more chaos theory with some changes and new ideas. Some of which I think are cool, and others I really don't care for. Starting with what I like is the concept of trust. As a Double Agent, you're working for two different masters, the good guys of the NSA and the bad guys of the JBA. During missions, you'll usually be given conflicting objectives by each group, and siding with one over the other will cause two different trust meters to rise and fall accordingly. If either of these meters drops all the way, it's game over, and the idea of possibly having to do things that go against your moral compass to ensure your standing is interesting. 
I say I like the idea because, at least on the normal difficulty, it's really easy to keep both sides happy. And you'll only ever get a game over if you do something incredibly stupid during the undercover missions. What are the undercover missions? They're the other thing I really like about Double Agent. While you'll do plenty of globetrotting in some really unique and interesting locations, every level or two you'll be brought back to the main JBA headquarters. While here you'll be given a task to complete by one of the main terrorists, like assembling mines or decrypting an email. And during this time when Sam is left alone, you have to discreetly sneak into restricted areas to complete NSA objectives. You're without your normal equipment during these parts, you can't attack anyone, which makes sense since it would be awfully suspicious for everyone to start going unconscious right after the new guy arrived, and you're under a time limit. These undercover sections are a great change of pace to the normal missions, and feel really good to pull off flawlessly because they fulfill the premise of being this covert operative playing both sides. Now onto the things I don't like. First are these brief action set piece moments that happen a handful of times. They feel so forced in and unnecessary, trying to artificially amp up the excitement. Oh no, every time I play this level, my parachute fails during insertion. What am I going to do? I'll hit a button and everything's fine. Oh no, every time I play this level, the pilot has a heart attack and I have to spend a grand total of two seconds stabilizing the helicopter and everything's fine. Next is a noticeable lack of polish, most notably from a technical standpoint. The game doesn't run that great, struggling to maintain a consistent frame rate at all times. I mean, it can look like a slideshow at points. To be fair though, this wasn't exactly uncommon with early 7th generation games as developers figured out how to use the hardware, but man is it rough. There's also an unnecessary progression system. You unlock new equipment and upgrades to existing equipment on a linear path by completing certain objectives. The problem I have with it is that many of these upgrades actually take interactivity away from the player. One of the earliest upgrades you get is automatic lockpicking, so instead of manually shifting each pin yourself, adding to the tension as you rush to get a door open, as has always been the case, you just wait for a bar to fill. There's also instances where hacking is pretty much immediately completed without your input. These would be fine if they were optional for those that really didn't want to do the minigames, but they aren't. Once you've unlocked something, it's permanent with no way to go back. On top of that, I didn't find myself using any of the additional equipment I unlocked, so it just leads to a cluttered inventory of mostly useless gadgets. But the big issue I have with Double Agent isn't what's in the game, it's what's not. Another big on and off trend during the 360 generation was the removal of HUDs. For the purposes of immersion, or to be more cinematic, developers started taking away health bars, ammo counters, and other useful information, and this is something I never cared for. Sometimes it's done well, I think Dead Space is a good example, but generally, if I have to choose between a game being more cinematic, or having information I need be clearly and reliably conveyed to me on screen, I am always going to choose the latter. Unfortunately, Double Agent disagrees with me and decided to make the HUD as minimal as possible. Remember those very useful light and sound meters? Well, those are gone now. In place of a light meter, we get a single light on Sam's back that turns three different colors. Green means you're hidden, yellow means you're exposed, and red means everything's gone to shit. And in place of a sound meter, we get... nothing. This is a poor substitute for what we had in previous games, and doesn't do an effective enough job at conveying how concealed you are. There are times where I think I'm in the dark, but the light is yellow. There are times I feel like I'm clearly visible, but the light is green. I never feel like I can trust it because it suddenly changes on a whim, and I can never be totally sure why. You can get some sort of feel for it, but it's never as reliable as you want or really need it to be. Even if you think it's fine, there's no arguing that taking away the HUD is in any way an improvement, so the change is pointless at best and detrimental at worst. And finally, there was Double Agent's take on Spies vs. Mercs. The basic setup is the same, with a team of spies trying to hack terminals, which they can now do from a distance at the cost of the hack taking longer, while the mercs play defense trying to stop them. But the multiplayer here felt very different. The action was sped up considerably for both sides, prompts were placed around the map to help guide players, and you could only hold one gadget at a time. Changes like this were made in an effort to make the mode appeal to a more casual audience. I remember enjoying Double Agent's competitive offering, and while I'd take either of the previous game's multiplayer over it any day, it was still a fun experience. The fanbase, however, didn't react positively to the changes, and the community dried up after a while. You can actually still search for matches online, but there's literally no one playing it anymore, so the best you can really do now is 1v3 matches against bots. It's not great, but it's better than nothing, I guess. All in all, Splinter Cell Double Agent made changes that I'd consider missteps, while also having some really cool ideas that make it unique. It pales in comparison to Chaos Theory for sure, but dismissing it outright is unfair, as it is still mostly fun to play through with some well-made missions. As far as ratings go, Double Agent is good, but not great. 7 out of 10. But wait! There's more!
So when I originally decided to do this video, I was only going to cover this version of Double Agent. It's the one that I played growing up, and it's considered canon with the future games in the series. But I've heard enough people over the years praise this version as just as good, if not better, that I decided to track down a copy myself and give it a run through. Yes, there are actually two completely different versions of Double Agent. Version 1 was developed by Ubisoft Shanghai for the 360, PS3, and PC, while version 2 was developed by Ubisoft Montreal for the original Xbox, PS2, GameCube, and later Wii. They share the same general plot and premise, as well as a few cutscenes, but the story plays out totally differently and the levels are entirely unique. Since there hasn't been a new Splinter Cell in nearly five years at this point, being able to play an entry I had never touched before, one I didn't know like the back of my hand, was really awesome for me personally. Even though it meant a good number of... Oops, God, shit. And having now finished it, I can see why there are people who prefer it over the 7th gen edition. I'm not sure I'd agree it's better, as I think it does some things more competently and some things less so, but it's definitely at least as enjoyable as version 1. First big improvement, the glorious return of a heads-up display. But, but how am I supposed to be immersed in the game when there are things on the screen? Seriously though, this is the most important difference between the two versions to me. And while I don't prefer this silhouette display they went for, as I also found it to be a bit unclear at times, at least it's there, and I'd probably have a better feel for it if I had played this game as much as I played the others. Version 2 also handles the setup for the story so much better. On the 360, you do a tutorial mission that has literally nothing to do with anything, and Sam is then abruptly informed of his daughter's inability to look both ways before crossing the street. But here, not only does this Iceland mission tie directly into the JBA plot, but there's actual build-up for the news about Sarah's death. You're going about things as normal, completing objectives, when suddenly Lambert, seemingly in a panic, calls for an abort. Done. I got info on the buyers. Now I'm going after Kadir. No, you're not. Abort the mission. What? I said abort. You too, Hamza. You are to extract immediately. The mission was to find the weapons. We haven't done that yet. What's going on? We have enough. I'm canceling your remaining objectives. Like hell you are. I'm not going anywhere. Sam, listen to me. We've got enough. Get out. Now. And only as a last resort does Lambert reveal that something has happened. You're testing my patience, Lambert. Believe me, Sam, I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't have a good reason. Something's happened. What? It's your daughter. The chopper's on its way. Lambert. This part is great, because not only does it make the reveal later less jarring, but it also lets the news sink in for both Sam and the player, as both wonder what's going on. In general, Sam is more fleshed out in this version for sure. He's given extra dialogue between missions as he explains his actions over the phone to the assistant director of the NSA, so you pretty much always know what was on his mind, and it's always nice to hear more Michael Ironside. This extra development for him does come at the cost of something else, though, and that's the villains. The main bad guys in version 1 weren't anything deep, they each pretty much fell into one-note archetypes, but at least you knew who they were. In version 2, you barely get to know any of them, as their plans and motivations are explained by Sam during the aforementioned phone conversations, making the group a lot more faceless. This leads to the big confrontations and certain plot moments falling totally flat. Most notably, everything with Enrica, who Sam apparently fell madly in love with at some point, just don't ask me when, because I have no fucking idea. So at the end, when she's killed by another Splinter Cell agent, this is enough for Sam to go berserk, murder the guy who was just doing his job, and go on the run. Boy, that escalated quickly. So the story in this game starts off stronger, but the lack of insight into the bad guys really bites the plot in the ass. Another big difference is how the trust system works. The two meters in the last game are replaced by a single meter that shifts from one side to the other depending on your actions. This change is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it does force you to make decisions you otherwise wouldn't in order to keep things balanced. You can't really be a goody two-shoes making the nice call all the time. To ensure the meter didn't shift all the way to the NSA side, I had to spend some missions going completely lethal when I otherwise wouldn't, and occasionally take actions to make sure the bad guys still liked me. On the other hand, there only being one meter means you're always losing the trust of one group no matter what you do, even if it doesn't make sense. In version 1, if you, say, planted a bug for the NSA, your trust for the JBA wouldn't be affected because they don't know you're betraying them. But in this version, doing the same thing automatically means a loss of trust from them just by the virtue of the meter only having one way to go. And this can get really annoying, especially if you have to do numerous primary objectives for one group in a row. And the final big change are the undercover missions, or rather, the lack thereof. Instead of discreetly slipping away into restricted zones all while trying to maintain your cover, the JBA headquarters missions play out like any other. 
You still don't have most of your equipment, but you're free to set off alarms and knock out everyone you come across without consequence. It's pretty frickin' ridiculous that no one questions why everyone in the compound suddenly became unconscious right as the new guy showed up, who has an extensive background as a stealth operative. I even overheard two guys talking about everyone getting knocked out as if it's some silly rumor. Some guy is supposed to be running around knocking people out. Didn't Sykes think that last week? And the week before. Still, he was right about Jaeger. Jaeger could have had I'm working for the feds tattooed on his forehead and been less obvious. Sykes is just paranoid. Yeah, man, he's just paranoid. I mean, there's 20 guys who are missing big chunks of time and happen to have fish-shaped lumps on the back of their head, but pff, that could be anything. This version also contained a co-op campaign like Chaos Theory, although I couldn't play it since there's no online and I don't have any friends. And the multiplayer seems to be the same as what was offered in version 1. So if you feel like playing Double Agent twice, this version is worth checking out. It's more than different enough to be called its own unique game, with some changes that are good and others that aren't. I'll give this Double Agent a 7 as well. After Double Agent didn't exactly set the world on fire, the folks in charge of Splinter Cell decided to take things in a new direction, which I wasn't against. It's always exciting to see what new innovations a long-running series can come up with to keep itself fresh, and, well, I'll give them this, they certainly tried something different. When Conviction was originally revealed to the world back in 2007, it showed a more rugged Sam sporting a black hoodie and a long Hot Topic haircut, and seemed to focus less on sticking to the shadows and more on combat and environmental interaction. I seem to remember how dynamically Sam could throw chairs being a major point during demos and interviews. Fan reaction was so negative to what was shown that Conviction, much like its leading man, went silent and wasn't heard from again for two years. Finally, at E3 2009, an entirely new version of the game was shown that focused on mobility and a new feature called Mark and Execute, which let Sam instantly take out a group of guys at the press of a button, and that's the game we got in 2010. Now, I'll say up front that I do enjoy Conviction, but there's a reason it's often considered the black sheep of the Splinter Cell series. It simply pales in comparison to every other entry, and while its faster pace and simplified mechanics undeniably provide some good instant gratification, it also feels kind of disposable. Think of Chaos Theory as a nice aged scotch, while Conviction is more like a light beer. Yeah, they're both alcohol, but the former is undeniably more refined, feels better to experience, and given the choice, most people are going to prefer it. Does this analogy work? I don't really drink much. Remember all those options you had in the other games? Well, those have been replaced with headshots, which is truly what conviction boils down to. Mark people for headshots, execute them with headshots, take out someone in close quarters to refill your ability to do more headshots, rinse and repeat. The stealth part really is secondary to all the murder, and while there are definitely sections where you can sneak past your opposition and move forward, the mechanics are so basic that it never really feels like much of an achievement. It just feels better to take out everyone as the game intended, and boy can it feel good. Those moments where you get up behind a guy, grab him, take out everyone in the room in like two seconds and finish by snapping your hostage's neck are pretty cool. And the new cover system is rather fluid, letting you quickly dash from cover to cover easily, so that's a plus. Everything about the gameplay has been drastically simplified. Whether or not you're hidden is now binary, with the screen going monochrome whenever you're in the shadows, and you know exactly what enemies are looking at you thanks to on-screen indicators. Lockpicking, hacking, picking up bodies, being non-lethal in any way, all of that has been scrapped, presumably to keep the flow of the gameplay as fast as possible. Sam also seems to be taking some sort of youth serum because he's more agile here than he's ever been before, scurrying along pipes and ledges like a goddamn cat on speed. Keep in mind that Sam is supposed to be 54 years old at this point. I'm not saying there aren't guys in their 50s who can move like a 20-year-old gymnast, but given how grounded and weighty all of Sam's moves were in the previous games, it's really weird to see him moving like this. Now you may be wondering, why is Sam murdering everyone? He seems to be in a foul mood. Well, you'd be correct, because he's been put in the middle of a really crappy and cliched story about revenge and conspiracies and cover-ups and man is it dumb. Sam's daughter? Yeah, she's actually been alive this whole time. Lambert had to fake her death to protect her from an NSA mole that was never discovered, who, spoilers, turns out to be the evil guy with slick back hair who always wears a villain trench coat, who somehow managed to turn Third Echelon into his own personal army that he plans to assassinate the president with, and somehow none of the government employees and splinter cells working under him seem to have an issue with this? I guess he must provide some really attractive dental plans and retirement benefits. God, this is fucking dumb! There's no mystery to this, no in-depth character building, it's just a cliched plot from a direct-to-video spy thriller. To its credit, though, the story does have one strong moment, and that's when Sam listens to the recording of Lambert explaining why he faked Sarah's death. 
Not only is the music that plays over this scene great, but the text that flashes around the room does an effective job of illustrating the thoughts and feelings Sam is experiencing learning that his late best friend betrayed him. This also segues into the best gameplay section, where Sam, I guess, is so pissed off and focused that you're given unlimited and automatic mark and executes, letting you effortlessly destroy everyone in your path as the building explodes and crumbles around you. Every time I play this scene, I can't help but slowly walk the entire way to emphasize the badassness. I highly recommend making sure you have a shotgun before you get to this sequence. It just feels great to use here. For the first time since the original Splinter Cell, there is no Spies vs. Mercs multiplayer. All that's left in its place are a brief co-op campaign and deniable ops. I haven't played it since launch, but I recall the co-op being fun mainly because the second person effectively doubled your number of executes. So if you and your partner timed things right, you could drop eight guys instantly. And the campaign has an admittedly neat twist ending. The deniable ops essentially boil down to quick terrorist hunt missions, asking you to do things like eliminate everyone in a level or protect an objective, and they're probably my favorite part of the game simply because you can get right into the cranium shattering without sitting through the slower, scripted moments of the campaign. Like I said before, I do enjoy playing Conviction, but it is without a doubt the weakest mainline entry in the series, with a poor story and a lot of concessions made to cater to the action crowd. It's not a good Splinter Cell game, but as an action game, it's decent enough fun, so I'll give Splinter Cell Conviction a 6 out of 10. Last but not least, we have Splinter Cell Blacklist, and yes, before we talk about the game itself, there's a certain elephant in the room that needs to be addressed. For the first time in the series, Michael Ironside did not return to voice leading man Sam Fisher. Acting duties this time were given to younger actor Eric Johnson, and fans were not exactly thrilled with this change. And to be frank, neither was I. And I'm still not. It seems the reason for this casting change was that Mr. Ironside was fighting cancer at the time and stepped away to focus on his health, which he revealed in a recent interview posted on Ubisoft's official YouTube page. If that's the case, I totally understand. One's health is way more important than voicing some imaginary spy man, and I 100% support his decision to walk away from the character during that time. And as a side note, I'm glad Mr. Ironside seems to be doing well, and I hope he's around for many years to come. However, I am going to throw some shade at the developers. If you can't get the iconic voice of your franchise's leading man back for whatever reason, then you shouldn't continue to build your game around him. Now, I know what some of you are thinking, but having someone other than Sam Fisher in the role would alienate fans. Sam is just as iconic as his trademark goggles. You can't just replace him. And I agree with you. I really do. But here's the thing. There is someone else in the role. Sure, his name is Sam Fisher, and people refer to him as Sam Fisher, but this guy? He ain't Sam, and it's not just the voice. All due respect, why don't we just leave the interrogation to the CIA? Forget the company man bullshit, Briggs, you're on our team now. His attitude, cadence, the way he talks to people, his almost complete lack of humor, the fact that he's supposed to be in his late 50s. This just isn't the same guy, no matter how many times we're told he is. And this isn't the fault of Eric Johnson, by the way. His acting is fine, and if he were literally anyone else, I wouldn't complain. Since Pandora Tomorrow, it has been clearly established that Sam is not the only Splinter Cell running around, so why not play as someone new and say Sam is retired or off doing other stuff? Yeah, fans would be upset that they weren't playing as the figure they've been with since the beginning, but how is it better to change practically everything about him just to keep the name? As it stands, as a longtime fan, it's hard to shake the feeling that something is off every time Sam opens his mouth. That controversial change seemed to be the biggest thing people talked about in regards to Blacklist, but putting that aside, how's the game itself? Well, pretty damn good, actually. Starting with the presentation, animations are smooth and chained together fluidly, all the cutscenes are directed well, and the whole thing has a sleek, tech look to it. Although, the lens flare can be pretty ridiculous at times, especially on the goggles. I mean, who directed this game? J.J. Abrams? <laughs> that joke's not played out at all. Playing Blacklist feels great, blending together the slower pace of the older games with the faster pace of conviction. Whether you're like me and like ghosting by people whenever possible, only using non-lethal takedowns, or you prefer Conviction's panther-like take-no-prisoners approach, both are equally viable and equally fun to pull off. There's also the option to armor up and go in guns a-blazing, and while I suppose the option is nice to have, I never felt compelled to play this way, because, you know, it's a stealth game. The game tracks your performance on each level, giving you points for the three different approaches that translates into in-game currency, which encourages you to replay missions to find the best ways to optimize your particular playstyle. 
This point system does come with one annoying quirk, however, and that's a reliance on a checkpoint system, with no option for quick saves. Now, I understand why the game is designed like this. It allows the levels to be compartmentalized into small sections so the game can easily track variables like how many people you've left untouched, for example. But if you think quick saves would ruin the point system letting people cheese their way to perfect scores, then maybe have a deduction for using them. Or better yet, a multiplier for not, so purists would be rewarded for ignoring the crutch. Either way, I still wish Blacklist had them, though admittedly their lack of inclusion isn't as big a deal here as the older games given your mobility and offensive options. The other big gripe I have with Blacklist is its need for a progression system. I'm of the opinion that in a game like this, you should be given all the tools you need to succeed up front, and then it should be up to the player to use them effectively. But in Blacklist, you have to buy upgrades and gear using the money you earn during missions. This system effectively gimps you at the start because you simply don't have the best gear, and therefore the best stats. In particular, your stealth rating is on the low end, meaning guards will hear you from surprisingly far away. All because you didn't spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to get the sneaky pants and the silent boots. And even when you do buy better gear, you still can't get the best until you complete Grimm's optional side missions, which are ghost-themed, meaning one alarm results in instant failure. So to get the best stealth gear, you have to complete the missions that were made for the best stealth gear. Makes sense. You also have to buy all your goggle upgrades, guns, and all their attachments. Now, it doesn't take a crazy amount of time to unlock the essentials, and I'll confess that it never felt like a grind since you earn cash at a good rate throughout the game. But this system feels unnecessary and limits your potential, not based on skill level, but by not having the best stuff. As a result, I'd actually recommend playing strictly Panther style for the first few hours, going full Silent Killer taking out everyone you come across since it's simply what you're best equipped for in the early game, and then going back and replaying missions more quietly once you have a better loadout. Thankfully, the game is still fun to play the way I just described, I just wish I didn't feel forced to do so. Thankfully, Blacklist brings back the competitive multiplayer that was absent in Conviction, and it's pretty good fun, catering to both old and new fans with modes that satisfy each demographic. There's what one might call a modernized version of Spies vs. Mercs that allows for 4v4 with all the bells and whistles you'd expect for more recent online games, like loadouts and special perks. Spies are basically as armed to the teeth as their counterparts, resulting in matches that are fast-paced, incredibly chaotic, and very entertaining. But Blacklist also offers a more classic option, bringing the player count to the original 2v2, removing class customization, taking away guns from spies, and significantly darkening the lighting in maps, giving spies better places to hide and forcing mercs to use their flashlights. It certainly still feels faster than the online of Pandora Tomorrow or Chaos Theory, but it retains their intensity and, most importantly, their spirit. There isn't a huge community of players these days, but I was able to find matches after just a few minutes of waiting, so it's absolutely worth giving a shot yourself. My issues with the leading man and progression system aside, Blacklist represents a bit of a return to form. It feels great, has good replay value, and currently provides the most accessible way to play the series' unique Spies vs. Mercs multiplayer. There are some tweaks that could be made here and there, but if this is the direction the Splinter Cell series continues to go in, I'd be more than happy with it personally, so I'm giving Blacklist an 8 out of 10. Blacklist, for the most part, was well-received, but failed to meet Ubisoft's sales expectations, and as a result, Splinter Cells seemed to go dark. Every year, I hoped for an announcement confirming a sequel to one of my favorite series, but for five years, us fans were given nothing. That is until April 2018, where this trailer dropped for another Ubisoft title, Ghost Recon Wildlands. I've got friends in that neighborhood. Call the ghosts. That in and of itself wasn't something worth getting all that excited about, but the return of gravelly Michael Ironside sure as hell was. It was so nice to hear his voice again, and while yeah, it was only for a small part in another game, this seemed like a tease for greater things to come. This got me really hopeful for a new, proper Splinter Cell title, and rumors seem to be suggesting that's exactly what we're gonna get. And while I'm practically salivating for whatever we get from a new entry, there are two things I hope to see from it. First off, I think this should be Sam's last hurrah. He's had a great run, but I feel like it's time to let the guy retire. He can't keep doing this forever. Give him the best pension you possibly can and let the man put his feet up on some tropical beach. He's earned it. I'm totally down to play as Sam again, especially if Ironside is really back to voice him, but at the end, he should hang up his trademark goggles and pass the torch. 
Or better yet, maybe have you play as Sam at first and then switch to a new guy and put Sam in a mentor or support role, giving advice and making references to his past exploits over comms. As long as it's handled well, I think us fans can let the gruff guy go. The second thing I hope for is that the next Splinter Cell doesn't fall into the tired Ubisoft template. You know what I mean, right? An open world game where you can go anywhere on a map littered with repetitive busywork and maybe some form of built-in online connectivity. No! I want actual structured levels designed to have replayability, not another sandbox. Coming from someone who has played some of the games in this series, no exaggeration, like 50 times, I don't need an entire continent to run around on to feel like I've gotten some oddly defined value. Though I suspect that's totally what it's gonna be. Just, just wait, they'll do a demo at E3 that shows Sam taking out bad guys, moving through a base, and then zoom out, oh my god, it's been open world this whole time and there's other players running around, isn't that cool? Even though we've done this kind of reveal 20 goddamn times? <sighs> Please, please, don't make it another cookie-cutter Ubisoft game. I mean, I'll still play it because it says Splinter Cell on the box, but please resist the urge. I beg you. And that concludes my stupidly long look back at the Splinter Cell series. I hope that you guys enjoyed listening to my thoughts on each game, and maybe with any luck I inspired some of you to check out the series for yourself. It really is worth experiencing. Please be sure to write the video one way or the other, whether or not you liked it. And in the comments down below, please share what your favorite Splinter Cell is, what you think of the series as a whole, or what you expect from a sequel. Thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you... Really? Recording my outro and the power goes out? <gasps> I know that noise! Mr. Fisher, I'm such a big fit. That's very kind of you.